Uh, so we have a great panel. Uh, Cynthia Main, uh, Cynthia is the executive VP at PIMCO. And uh, here is how I will summarize what Cynthia does. She pretty much takes care of all asset classes at PIMCO in terms of post-trade issues. Uh, is, is that a good way to? Okay, okay. So, and then we have uh, Kashif Riaz. Uh, and uh, Kashif is a managing director at Black at BlackRock. And they've come out with a really interesting uh, paper, a really interesting concept in terms of how to address liquidity in the bond market. So uh, I think it's going to be fascinating hearing Kashif. And uh, you can't have a panel without a regulator. So we have uh, Sai Srinivasan. Sai is the chief economist at the CFTC. And obviously, the CFTC has been playing a big role in terms of regulations regarding uh, swaps and the derivatives markets and the whole clearing bit. Uh, so we're going to have we're going to go all the way from bonds to derivatives to all asset classes. And uh, th this morning it was uh, interesting. You know, Dan Gallagher started off with uh, talking about the bond market and how how we are not paying enough attention to the risk that might get created. And FSOC is not that focused on the bond market, the muni bond market, or the corporate bond market. And uh, there is a lot of retail participation in the bond market. And as interest rates go up and suddenly everybody tries to exit, what might be some of the issues in the bond market? Uh, so uh, Kashif is going to be in a good place to talk about those issues. And uh, so I'm going to start off, let's start off with the bond markets. And uh, again, Commissioner Gallagher talked about how because regulation has changed, we have Basel, we have the Walker Rule. The dealers used to be market makers and they had their balance sheets and they used their balance sheets. And now that those balance sheets are not being used as much because of the new regulations, uh, and uh, they're, they're sort of uh, less interested in making markets and providing the liquidity. So, Kashif, let me turn it over to you and uh, talk about uh, why this liquidity in the bond market has gone away. What are the issues? What's causing that? Later, we'll come back to solutions that you propose. But first, talk about how has the structure of the markets changed and why? Yeah, sure. Um, so your uh, your uh, introduction mentioning Commissioner Gallagher's comments, I think, is uh, is spot on, and it's a it's a good good uh, start at diagnosing the diagnosing the problem, which is that so the the the, the bond market has for for decades been a over-the-counter market where it's a principal market and the uh, large investment banks which act as dealers are the liquidity providers. Uh, traditionally, they uh, each have uh, a, uh, a trading desk for really each sub-asset class within fixed income. So for purposes of this discussion, we can focus on corporate bonds and maintain significant inventories and meet uh, client, and that can be both retail and institutional investor, demand for buying and selling through their uh, inventory or warehouse of, uh, of bonds. The, uh, the reason that uh, liquidity has diminished post the global financial crisis is, it's relatively simple. It's the, you know, one, the structural incentives of regulation, both Basel III, as well as uh, elements of Dodd-Frank, including the Volcker Rule, have, uh, uh, have made it more expensive to hold inventory of corporate bonds. So as a result, the, <coughs> the uh, inventory held by the broker dealers has gone down uh, quite significantly. The, uh, there's a good data series from the, uh, from the New York Fed which tracks uh, uh, dealer holdings of uh, a lot of credit products, including corporate bonds as well as private label mortgage backed securities, and it's a pretty stark chart that uh, shows a sharp decline post-2007 and you know, stabilization thereafter. So I would say that in the past few years, what we've seen is, uh, is, a, is a stable environment that's just a lot lower than it uh, used to be prior to the financial crisis. So that's one element, regulation. I wouldn't lay the entire explanation for the structural changes in the market um, on regulation, though. I think that the business models of the banks themselves have changed. Obviously, the there were a lot of learnings from the financial crisis. And one of the main sources of balance sheet losses for the large global investment banks and universal banks 
was very significant markdowns in the uh, in the value of credit assets that they held on balance sheet. The most the prominent culprit was uh, uh, were the warehouses of uh, mortgage-backed securities being held uh, in advance of packaging into into CDOs. But there were also very large losses on uh, on leverage loans, etc. But really, uh, the general risk appetite for credit product uh, on bank balance sheets changed in a very uh, in a very defining way uh, post post the financial crisis, and 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 business models have changed and evolved. Where the if you really talk to any of the large financial intermediaries, uh, they will talk about credit markets generally as a distribution model, an origination model. What they're looking to do is is increase the velocity of their capital, which means hold less on balance sheet at any given time. What that means is that the relevance of a uh, dealer intermediated OTC market with balance sheets uh, providing the inventory has really gone down. In a way, the market practices have moved on. So when large asset managers like ourselves or PIMCO today wish to uh, trade large lots of uh, corporate bonds, in general, what we'll find is that uh, there is a practical ceiling as to how much can be traded with any counterparty at any time. And uh, in many cases, those trades are stretched out over a period of time, or our traders have to break those trades up into smaller blocks and uh, find a larger number of counterparties to work with. Um, in effect, market practices have moved on to a agented market, where the banks are acting as agents not taking principal risk, but they're working to match buyers and sellers. Um, so you have a principal market structure, but agented market practices. Um, and all that's happening in a market environment where credit markets are really growing very rapidly. Um, one of the other comments that Commissioner Gallagher made at the tail end of his remarks was just about the boom in, uh, in uh, fixed income issuance over the past few years. Um, it's a very natural consequence of a low interest rate environment a uh, market environment that uh, is pretty positive, positive for credit assets. We have low interest rates coupled with, uh, with uh, generally corporate leverage going down, which means that uh, it's profitable to invest in, in bonds. So investor assets, both retail and institutional, have, have shifted into bonds over the past few years. Companies responding to the interest rate environment have increased issuance. So you. You have a lot of activity in the primary market, in the new issue market, um, which is uh, in some ways making up for the diminished liquidity in the secondary market. So the problem that we've talked about, the structural problem of low liquidity, hasn't necessarily manifested itself yet because of the positive market backdrop. But as, as we talked about earlier today, a different market environment where rates are rising and there are outflows from credit assets uh, could lead to a very uh, uh, very stressed uh, market environment where some of the deficiencies of market structure really come to light. Uh, thank you. There was a, a lot of conversation earlier today about pre and post uh, transaction transparency. And Cynthia, you, you're in a very good position where you see this for all asset classes. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts about how that, especially in the post transaction uh, environment, how is that transparency changing for diff different asset classes, including bonds, including equities? Mm -hmm. Well, just to build on Kashi's point, um, it's true that with best execution being a, a demand on behalf of our investors, we would ostensibly try to get the lowest price. But that's not actually the case. Because of um, the fact that it's an agency market, we do try to break up our trades into smaller pieces. And then in the post-trade environment, we will measure the ability of the dealer to actually deliver the securities that we buy. So many dealers will perhaps offer a teaser price, so it looks like we might be able to get some execution there, but actually um, they failed to deliver the securities that we bought. So um, for that, uh, where we might be sitting on uninvested cash, we might uh, be having some credit risk with them, with that dealer, we would be there after stealing more, uh, steering business towards the dealers that have an ability to deliver. The other thing that happens in the um, post-trade environment with related asset classes like credit default swaps, um, interest rate swaps, the mortgage TBA market, um, and foreign exchange is we look to collateralize um, forward exposure. And to the extent that a dealer uh, might be 
trading with us um, on the secondary market in the corporate bond market, if they aren't satisfying our requirements for collateral in terms of delivering collateral for the derivatives marketplace or making their payments on time for um, the interest rate swaps marketplace, then again, we, we would deem them to be a less worthy counterparty and steer some business towards the counterparties that we feel more safe with. So we want to deal with counterparties that are going to deliver their securities to us that we buy. That's kind of our one of our one of our things in the post trade environment. Um, also, when they fail, we will then look to collateralize the fails. So if the if the dealer fails to deliver us the mortgages and we're stuck out there with a TBA that has failed to deliver, we'll look to collateralize the fail as well. If the dealer is unwilling to collateralize the fail, now we don't have our security, we don't have our collateral, we have nothing. Again, we're going to start steering some of the um, secondary market corporate bond uh, type type trades. You know, we, we rank all of our counterparties. We'll start steering our business across all asset classes to counterparties that can can deliver on what they say they're going to deliver. So, uh, so the suggestion about standardization of bonds again, it came up uh, again and again this morning. Uh, J.P. Morgan has thousands of uh, bond QCIPs outstanding, and uh, a city will have thousands of them, and uh, does that make it more difficult to trade on an electronic platform? Um, and there was a comment, I think, from the audience that said, well, the OTC market has a similar situation, but, uh, but you see the OTC, uh, I'm sorry, options market, and the options do trade on an electronic uh, framework. But, uh, but BlackRock has come up with a recommendation about standardization of corporate bonds. And it's kind of interesting to see, you see that standardization with uh, sovereign debt, but you don't see it in the corporate bond market. And uh, please talk about um, your proposal and, and also talk about what's the pushback that you're getting. Sure. Is the pushback from uh, issuers? Is the pushback from market participants? What, what, what is the stopping it? Sure. So. Our uh, thought process around standardization of corporate bonds uh, evolved roughly as follows. We, along with many other industry participants, have uh, spent a lot of time over the last several years uh, thinking about the future of fixed income trading. And uh, there's been a lot of uh, effort devoted to electronic platforms, a lot of analogies drawn to markets which have successfully uh, transition to be largely electronic over the last decade. Uh, equities, FX, futures, et cetera, are all effectively traded on, uh, on platforms and seem to enjoy greater liquidity than credit products. So, and at the same time, there are a number of companies, both reasonably well-established as or, and at the startup phase that, have, uh, that are looking to establish uh, businesses as electronic fixed income products. Uh, while essentially studying all of those options, one of the conclusions we came to was that uh, trying to increase liquidity in credit products by shifting from the current trading model of a OTC market to a platform, whether electronic or, or exchange-like, will run into some natural limits because there are simply too many bonds. And what that means is that the trading activity that there is uh, the liquidity that exists is very fragmented across uh, a very large number of uh, different different securities that are not they're not fungible they're not they're not the same thing. Um, as a result, I think if our, you know our view is is that if uh, we want to have a shot of successfully making of successfully increasing liquidity in credit products by shifting to platforms and electronic trading. It uh, needs to be accompanied by some level of standardization. What we mean by standardization is, uh, is a change really in primary and new issue practices so that uh, the, over time, the total number of uh, outstanding securities of a given issuer is lower than it is now. Um, rather than issuing small individual securities in response to specific investor inquiries or or to kind of uh, or to specific arbitrage opportunities on the interest rate curve, um, we think that companies should continue to generally shift to larger benchmark-sized issuances. Um, having said that, we want to be very clear that uh, that doesn't mean so. It's very natural for every company to have 
one stock ticker, there's one class of shares. It's also very natural for uh, companies to want to have a significant number of bonds outstanding. Companies are looking to have diversified exposure to interest rates, looking to have diversified and mitigated refinancing risk, and to kind of manage the amount of debt that matures each year. So somewhere between 1 and 1,000 is the right answer for each company. I know that's a, that's a vague answer, but uh, we've uh, laid it out in a bit more detail in, in, in some of our publications. But uh, what we think is, is, is that in order to increase liquidity, gradually there should be a move towards standardizing some terms, not just size, uh, standardizing some terms so that over time, uh, cash bonds for large public companies should be not should should just be not bespoke instruments. They should be more easy to understand, more interchangeable, and that it's just more amenable to trading on a platform and concentrating liquidity rather than fragmenting liquidity. Yeah, thank you. So moving a little bit away from bonds into the world of swaps, and the CFTC has been. Uh, very active uh, with swaps, proposing new rules. Uh, and uh, Sai, you've been, uh, so there were new rules about reporting, about clearing, about uh, trading. And uh, now you've been collecting this data on all of these issues. Uh, so what, what are the new rules? How have they been implemented? And the data that has been collected, what is it telling you? So as you, you know, Sort of take the uh, sort of four buckets in which the uh, sort of rules that we finalized, uh, the Dodd Frank rules. Actually, there's a public meeting tomorrow where you're going to be proposing a couple of other rules. Yeah, it's on. Maybe oh, okay. I should just turn it up here. Yes. Uh, so the there's one which we call the business conduct rules, which is all very loyally stuff. Uh, I try to sort of stay away from it. Uh, and then you have the clearing uh, rules. Uh, then uh, the reporting rules, clearing rules, and trade execution rules. Uh, so the the clearing, I think the reporting rules went uh, effect became effective first. Uh, then the clearing determination basically says that. So any swap that uh, we regulate, if somebody transacts in it, they have to report it to a swap data repository. And there's real time reporting rules, and there is uh, regulatory reporting. And the real-time reporting rule, basically there's a ticker tape that's available where on a real-time basis you can see all the swap transactions and all the asset class. Just like, just like we have grown up seeing the equity ticker tape on, uh, on CNBC that is now online uh, a ticker tape for the swap markets. Uh, in my shop, we personally don't spend much time looking at it, uh, but based on discussions from market participants, uh, I think there is a lot, it's, a lot of people look at it, it'll be eager to see what uh, PIMCO and BlackRock, uh, whether that traders are looking at it. We do know that there are instances where some firms uh, believe that uh, their trading strategies might be uh, not being protected. So you know, if somebody feels that they've been hurt by the transparency rules, then we get to know about it. So, uh, so I think, so that's, the, you have real-time reporting, then historical reporting, which comes to the regulators. Uh, and then there is clearing determination, basically, which lays out uh, which swaps need to be uh, mandatorily cleared by a registered clearing house. And then a subset of those swaps have to be traded on uh, either what we call the swap execution facilities or on the futures exchange. So those are sort of the four classes. Uh, all the rules have gone into effect, uh, sort of uh, busy with implementation. I won't go into the details, but the interesting thing is on the data side, what we're doing with it. Uh, those who sort of follow the developments in this market would be aware that uh, I think the way the press characterizes it is like it's messy. And uh, there have been comments made that somebody tried to download the data and the systems crashed in the, in the CFTC building. Uh, that's far from the truth. Uh, the data is messy because the sort of a fundamental difference between the data that you get, say, from the futures world and the data that's there for the swap world. The futures world, in terms of some extent, the equity world also, you get the data. The millions of people trading, and the trading activity happens on exchanges, sort of centralized platforms, and the platforms report the trade to us. In the swaps world, there are hundreds of thousands of traders, smaller number of sort of uh, 
what are called swap dealers, about 107 swap dealers and major swap participants who have sort of mandatory reporting requirements. Uh, so there are a large number of traders who have obligations to report the transactions to us. So there are a large number of moving parts, very complex products. In some asset classes, the number of fields goes out into like 200, 300 fields. Uh, and uh, it's still sort of work in progress. But where we are in, uh, in my office, what we do is we put out what we call the weekly swaps report. So we collect the data that comes from the swap market and for interest rates and credit default swaps, the index uh, swaps, uh, we aggregate the data and we sort of publish. Uh, so right now we are at the stage where uh, we're cleaning the data, aggregating it and publishing it, and uh, eventually looking to uh, add other asset classes. In terms of analysis, so what do we- Can I ask you yeah. something there, Sai? I'm gonna go back to what uh, Rachel was talking about. Uh, I think Rachel said 98% of the data has been collected in the last two, nine zero, ninety percent of the data has been collected in the last two years, right? So you are collecting this massive amount of data, and her sort of question was, so what do you do with that data? You're, you're putting the reports together, but more than the reports, how is this data going to be helpful? So the, as I said, uh, the next step is sort of analysis of the data. So there is. Uh, there are, there, are, there are staff and other divisions who are using the, the data to assess uh, the risks in the sense of we have the clearing determination uh, and we require that large number of uh, participants clear the swaps. Uh, so the, the data is being used to analyze uh, the risk exposures from the clearing perspective. You know, what are the margins coming? What are the exposures being taken? Are the, uh, are the transactions being collateralized? So there's a huge portion of you know what the G2 does. Uh, there is a lot more that needs to be done, uh, and it won't be just the CFTC is going to be doing uh, uh, using the data. Uh, all the other regulatory agencies have to be using data. We're sort of interested at some point in sort of working with the academic world and giving them access to the data. Uh, and uh, the reality is that CFTC is incredibly understaffed. So I'm sorry, it's like you know. Anytime you get somebody from CFTC on a panel, we we complain and bitch over the fact that we don't have enough money, uh, and that's that's an issue. But the it, a lot of people uh, may not be aware that when Congress uh, passed uh, Dodd Frank, there was a language in the Act which basically places some restrictions on the on our ability to sort of share the data with other agencies. Uh, and that's still sort of being worked through. And at some point, those uh, the statute will hopefully be amended, or the lawyers will figure out some ways to uh, work within the rules and be able to sort of share the data. So right now, we're sort of custodians of the data. We're doing uh, some cleanup, some analysis, putting out some aggregate thing. And in our own way, we're sort of beginning to sort of do some analysis. So there's a lot that can be done. Yeah. Still early days, and you'll be amazed at uh, how difficult it is to work with the data. You know, any researcher has done any empirical work, uh, you know you spend most of your time cleaning up the data, uh, and uh, that's uh, what we do. So can I just make a, a small comment? I wouldn't uh, throw yourself on the sword too much here, okay? Because the goal of knowing whether there's another lurking AIG or some foreign counterparty, foreign, you know, investor, somebody, uh, nefariously introducing systemic risk through a lot of buy-side firms and a lot of different accounts to the point where they've introduced tremendous systemic exposure, none of it collateralized, which would lead to another crisis. This is a good goal. So lots of details have been worked on, whether uh, giving every single counterparty, every single pension fund a specific, like, ID, like a driver's license ID, like a tax ID, around the whole world, the legal entity ID. So you would know if these people are trading transactions and it all comes together, this is actually one party introducing the systemic risk. The goal of reporting collateral against those derivatives, very good goal. I would just comment, and, and many of you know I sit on the board of DTCC. We, we were the party selected to develop this trade warehouse. And then I also uh, represent the buy side in some, some trade organizations. Look, it's like, it, it would be like knitting a sweater. Somebody has to do the cuff, sleeve, the neckline, the body, the different parts. And when we came to put it all together, everybody coded to their specs, but it didn't exactly hang together quite right. 
that's not entirely your fault. That's trying to get hundreds and hundreds of firms that participate in the financial markets worldwide, not just US, US investors, but non-US investors investing in the US to, to, to adhere to these specs. And some things weren't really worked out. Well, I'm inches and you're meters, you know, so it doesn't fit together until we, you know, it didn't really hang together when we went live. But I would say in the past year, everyone has pulled together. It's been a great example of come together for the higher goal. And I think, uh, you know, I would say the CFTC is doing a great job in interpreting the data, and uh, and you should you should be you should be proud of that. It just it's just coming along, okay. So, but it's going to get there. We all feel it's going to get there. It's going to protect our industry that we strive to restore its reputation. It's going to do that in the future, and that's and and so and and that that will that purpose will be served. So, following up on that. Uh the changes that are taking place in the swap world, how is that affecting the buy side based on sort of the new regulations and the new rules that are coming out and uh, the central uh, repository? Uh, so how, how is that affecting the buy side? Yeah. Uh, you know, well, to, to take uh, Ty's point, business contact, this is a good, business contact, this is a good goal. I mean, we should all be doing a good job at business contact. So that's, that's a no-brainer. Reporting was tough. It's the sweater I just described, okay? And we're still going through it. You know, exactly what is a trade ID? Exactly what is legal entity ID? And what's a business registered address? You know, is PIMCO Newport Beach or is it Delaware for our mutual fund? Um, the whole uh, clearing, well, clearing is a good goal. Actually, PIMCO has been clearing swaps since November of 2009. As soon as the crisis hit, we worked with the CME, Perry, to set up clearing for our clients because we were concerned about the, the long-term viability of some of the counterparts. So clearing is a, is a good goal, and, uh, and we would endorse that, that effort. In terms of trade execution, I would say the buy side was a little bit, and the transparency in uh, trade reporting, a little bit taken aback. At first, yes, it, we felt it was possible when looking at the sprint on Bloomberg to tell which trades were PIM code. This is the PIM code total return fund. It's a, a fund that we take great pride in, and our portfolio managers are esteemed world, worldwide. We really don't want other people front running or coattailing on our strategy. And, and it was possible to see what our trades were because everybody knows on the dealer side what our trade IDs look like and where they all were. So, um, but that we all overcame that. There was a back off, there was a re um, design of the trade ID, and, and now I think it's a little bit more opaque who is placing these trades in the marketplace. And in terms of stocks, um, look, you know, this is a, a fragmented market, as Kashif was saying. We tried to split up our trades across who can supply the inventory. We have to be very careful about exactly how much we trade across 25 brokers for a firm our size so that, so that there's not information leakage and then people start front running us and it becomes more difficult for us to execute. The, in, the investment strategy, the primary purpose is to generate a risk-adjusted return for our clients. We can't do that if we're pushing the market away from ourselves. So uh, the, the, the idea of the stuff was at first a little bit daunting because you're having to tell the world what you're about to do. So they're seeing the end of the movie before it's played out. I think, um, I think the whole idea of uh, made available to trade and enough liquidity before it gets on the stuff has seemed to, has seemed to, to to do that. And again, like some of this is not my role because I'm more infrastructure, IT and operations, and less about well, what's the right place to place our liquidity. Um, so in terms of hooking up to the steps, I would say it's, it's you know, what I can say is it's, it's you know, it, it was shocking at first to the buy side, but um, the goal was good. Yeah, so it's like just on this point of the, the trade execution, I guess. Uh, the dot Frank. Uh, one of the sort of goals was to bring introduce uh, transparency into the markets, and as we know, transparency is uh, you know, it's a double-edged sword in some sense, right? Uh, so if it's my trade, I don't want anybody to know. But if somebody else is trading, I want to know. And it's been a sort of an age-old issue. So in terms of developing uh, our rules, uh, it was a sort of a highly debated process, and it continues to sort of be a thing because the last thing we want to do is uh, actually kill the market. So. Uh, we tried to develop the rules where we gave a decent amount of flexibility to the market participants in terms of you know, how they design the systems. And uh, you know, the economists uh, have a sort of uh, big role uh, in the 
implementation that's going on. It's still work in progress. Uh, there are about 22 steps, and we allowed them to uh, get going uh, without having full registration and working through sort of permanent registration and sort of going through the rule books. Business practices are being uh, developed, and as we all know, it's like these are all private companies, uh, highly competitive, and people are looking for uh, any edge that they can get over the competitors. So to the extent there is. Uh, the regulation provides them an opportunity to innovate and give, gain a competitive advantage. They try to do that. So it's uh, so from a market structure perspective, it's sort of very fascinating times for people sort of uh, following the developments in this market. It's interesting. I mean, the CEFs, uh, there are over 20 CEFs now, as you said, I think yeah, over 20, 22. Yeah. Um, so now what's coming about, uh, infrastructurally, it's tough to connect to every one of these CEFs. Absolutely. The IT um, budget, a smaller firm may not have that type of budget. So people are waiting to see where to hook up to. Um, so what's coming about now are CEF aggregators. Like it's sort of like latency arbitrage, you know, which is, so um, so we'll see how this works out. So in some sense, the market structure, at least from the CFTC perspective, we're used to sort of vertically integrated platforms. The execution and the clearing happen on vertically integrated platforms. But the SOFs market is more akin to what we see in the equity space. But the level of complex Complexity is, I think, worse than what you have in the, in the corporate bond world. So it's like the worst of both worlds in all worlds, I guess. Uh, but uh, it's uh, so it's, it's interesting times. It's challenging for us. It's challenging for the market participants. But it's uh, it's working. So, so one of the challenges I hear market participants talk about is uh, the CFTC regulates the non-security swaps, and then the SEC regulates uh, the security-based swaps. Right, that market. And obviously, the non-security, what CFTC is regulating, that's the huge part of the market, and SEC does only a small part. Is there coordination, harmonization, anything going on there? That's a challenge for me. from SEC here. No, actually, uh, we coordinate a lot with uh, SEC. Uh, we, we, we chat to them regularly, not just in the context of the swaps market, the dot time rules, but and even in terms of the Dodd-Frank rules, there were two major rules where we finalized the rules at the same time. Part of it was because Congress mandated us uh, the entity definitions in terms of who's a swap dealer, a major swap participant, and also the product definition. What's a swap? What's uh, a security-based swap? It was a joint rulemaking which required us to sort of work together. Uh, and uh, so, and as we continue to sort of finalize other rules, uh, we do sort of talk to them a lot. And even in the implementation phase, if you, uh, there are a lot of trading strategies that uh, institutions have where, uh, you know, it, it spans uh, the both worlds, I guess. And there are interesting issues that come up in terms of, you know, how our rules apply to those transactions. And we end up picking the phone and uh, chatting with the SEC. So, so this is sort of SEC, CFTC uh, turf, uh, but let's move a little bit global. And uh, even with bonds, uh, are, there, are there changes taking place outside the U.S. that is sort of different from what's happening in the U.S.? And what kind of challenges does that create for the marketplace, especially in terms of regulation or even in terms of market practices, competition, are the markets getting driven in somewhat different directions or there's a lot of convergence? I think the, uh, I'll start. I think the uh, story in the credit markets is uh, pretty similar at different levels of development across different parts of the world. So obviously the, uh, you know, the U.S. bond market is the world's largest, deepest capital market um, and it's was already the largest and has seen a lot of growth over the last several years. And frankly, one of the major trends in the U.S. capital markets has been the increasing usage of U.S. markets by international issuers as a source of capital. So the, when we look at uh, the proportion of issuers raising financing that are um, either from Europe or, uh, or emerging markets, it's ticked up. It's not quite half the market, but it's, uh, but it's so it's approaching that number from uh, being much smaller just just 10 years ago. Uh, in addition, on the investor side of the market, while the largest institutions are U.S. asset managers and insurance companies, increasingly those institutions' customers are very global in nature. Um, 
So you see a lot of international capital from, uh, you know, from Asia in particular, but also Europe uh, come, to, come to the US in search of fixed income investment opportunities. Uh, so, so that's been a that's been a that globalization both on the issuer and investor side has been a has been an important driver of growth. Turning towards the European capital markets, obviously, uh, Europe's kind of the depth of Europe's financial crisis occurred a few years after the U.S. If, if the depth in the U.S. was in late 2008, in uh, in Europe it was in 2011. So you had a you had a, you know a period of regression, so to speak, in the development of the capital markets in Europe. But uh, since uh, since then, as Europe has had some of the same uh, some of the same uh, or, or similar monetary policy steps that, that the US had to, to address the address the crisis, you've seen the same types of uh, reactions in the capital market there, where, uh, where issuance has grown a great deal, funds have flowed into credit, and the European capital markets have seen growth. Um, in addition, I think one other post-crisis development in the capital markets has been uh, really the creation of new sub-asset classes to uh, provide that intermediate capital between debt and equity. So really, um, you know, as a result of Basel III, um, man, you know, financial institutions were mandated to uh, add a, uh, add quite, you know, to recapitalize in quite, uh, quite, uh, Significant magnitude uh, through the use of both just increasing increasing equity capitalization, but also uh, through uh, hybrid instruments that are you know, colloquially called cocos or contingent capital. Uh, that's been a market that, in the last two years, out of nowhere, has uh, really become broadly accepted by 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 global investors. Uh, I think that's a, that's a, that's a very important uh, development to look at. I think the Asian markets on their own. Um, haven't developed quite as fast as uh, observed, observers would have thought a few years ago. I think what you're seeing is more integration of the Asian markets with the global markets. Um, uh, and Asian capital and issuers come to both US and Europe. And you see more capital raising occur in a global format where the same deals are marketed across, across the continents and time zones. But you've seen less of a development of a Kind of Asia only capital market, with the exception of the kind of offshore Chinese uh, market in Hong Kong. Your uh, BlackRock's uh, standardization proposal is uh, does this have to start with the US? Does the, the, does the US bond market, if it happens, will it have to start from the US or will the Europeans uh, or so, Asia sort of take off? Um, it's an interesting question. Uh, it's most effective in the U.S. because it's the world's largest capital market, so there's the most acute problem to solve. But frankly, it's a much easier framework to implement if you have a greenfield. So if you have a if you have a market where there's not much of a say an institutional fixed income market, and the local investment community and regulator want to create a corporate bond market um, in a way that's more organized and immediately is focused on uh, Transparency and liquidity. Uh, it's actually easier to start in a, in a greenfield environment. What tends to happen in uh, in uh, in new markets is that first a private placement like market emerges, and then it kind of shifts to uh, shifts to public institutional capital over time. So if one wants to leapfrog, then uh, I think jumping to a platform based, and more transparent model first uh, uh, would have some chances of good, good chances of success. Uh, part, partly because um, I'm working with the Central Bank of India, the Reserve Bank of India, and uh, Raghu Rajan there. And one of the things we're looking at very carefully is how do you get the corporate bond market going in India? And uh, there's a lot of private placements. They tend to be uh, private placements rather than public issues. And, uh, and that in India, there is actually a conversation taking place about... Uh, and not having that many QSIPs and that many bonds, and that would bring liquidity to the market. So but I was reading BlackRock's recommendations with uh, a lot of interest uh, from that point of view. So, so that's, yeah. that's and talking about the bond markets uh, globally. And uh, since in your world, what are you seeing differences in terms of 
what's happening in Europe, and especially in terms of regulation and being different there versus being different here? And how's the buy side dealing with it? Well, um, and it builds on your point earlier about the CFTC, SEC. There are numerous regulators all over the world that are right now very active in um, regulating the derivatives market. So we have um, uh, the, the European EMIR regulations, we have Singapore, we have Canada, and we have Australia coming about. And we just had uh, the introduction of the deadline for collateral and valuation in the U.S. So, uh, so for a buy side firm, I think it brings up Rachel's point that it's going to be tougher for single asset class, smaller uh, participants to uh, mm -hmm. to be viable in the long haul because the regulation is important to restore the the honor within our industry. Yet it's expensive to conduct for all of these different competing regimes. So what the buy side tends to do is to get together under the umbrella of trade associations like SIFMA or like the Association of Institutional Investors. And we try to um, go through policy advocacy work where we, we might try to work on, okay, what are, what are the common traits across all these regulations versus what are the differences and what are the things that are merits in their own right. So, um, so in terms of derivatives, uh, one of the differences is two-sided reporting in, in, uh, in EMIR that caused a lot of additional kind of uh, the sweater not hanging together effect. Um, there's a big regulation that's happening with MIFID right now in Europe, which is the T plus two settlement. We haven't really talked about that too much, but in three weeks, <laughs> all across Europe, um, debt, equity, warrants, ETFs, and most likely the derivatives on top of those instruments will be settling in two days. So uh, this is a big difference compared to the U.S. where it takes three days. We go back to our earlier comments about the viability of counterparties being one of the drivers of where we place our trade. It's one of the components of our best execution analysis. It's not just TCA. It's um, how, how likely is that counterparty to deliver on its trade three days later. The probability of delivery goes up if the time to settlement is shorter. So there's an instance where the buy side is endorsing the T plus two effort in Europe, even though it's expensive to implement, especially off of, off, uh, across all those different markets. Uh, versus in the states where we just have one depository, it wouldn't be that hard. Yet we wait for regulators to um, to opine in favor of the end investor, which is a shorter settle cycle. Before I open it up for questions, any last comments from any of our panelists? Uh, so we we have we have some time for questions. Any? Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is the standardization of corporate bond market. I, I understand the goal is very in the goodwill, but uh, the corporate bond is very complex. Uh, it's different from CDS. It's easy to standardize. The bond has all different features, option, bond, tunnel, all the kinds of things. I wonder how your willingness is perceived from the issuer side. And also, since you mentioned the goal is to promote the liquidity, I wonder through which channel you expect your new standardization corporate bond are going to achieve for the liquidity. For example, the new liquidity measure Peter just mentioned on um, some volume, uh, volatility, all kinds of things. My second question is, uh, you know, in the derivative market, uh, because of unique netting feature, the counterparty risk is big concern. Now, C uh, CFTC is in charge of the derivative things. I wonder what, what kind of concern CFTC has want to put special effort on removing or alleviating people's concern on the counterparty risk in terms of you dealing with the CDS. Thanks. So with respect to standardization of corporate bonds, you're correct in that uh, in that bonds have the ability to be customized in an essentially infinite way. They can have optionality and and uh, and, and very detailed covenants and, uh, and a lot of uh, highly tailored features. What we've observed is that uh, for generally both for large companies and mid-sized companies, very few of those uh, distinct features are actually used. Um, so the vast majority of issuance follows a relatively straightforward framework that it's senior unsecured debt with a uh, pretty well-defined uh, covenant package. And most uh, most of the debt that's issued is uh, most of the investment grade debt that's issued is 
not callable in an economic sense, but may have some legal call features in case of uh, takeovers and, and measures, et cetera. So our view is, is that there's a very large pool of uh, capital that's uh, de, de facto uh, is uh, a candidate for standardization. And there will always be a subset of, uh, of capital uh, where companies have very specific needs uh, for certain features. And that subset can, can and will continue to coexist in a less liquid, almost private placement-like form, while things that are essentially vanilla in flavor can be standardized. Uh, your second part of that question was, um, how is the, what's the effective uh, channel for the liquidity to be transmitted, so to speak? So, simple example is if you take a typical U.S. investment grade company um, that is a somewhat seasoned user of the capital markets, they might right now have say, five separate securities in the eight to 12 year maturity range. We would uh, propose consolidating those into a smaller number so that the, um, so that there's more liquidity in each individual bond. Larger trade sizes are enabled. When larger trade sizes are enabled, a few things are likely to happen. One, when that issuer comes to market with a new deal, the discount demanded by the uh, investor community for that new deal should be smaller. So right now, the average new issue concession uh, or discount is, let's say, five basis points of yield in the corporate bond market. When you look at the treasury and uh, agency bond market, that number is more like one or less basis points. So there's some efficiency gains to be had there. In addition, the bid offer spread um, should narrow when liquidity increases. So there's a, ben there's a concrete benefit both to issuer and investor in that construct. Obviously, it's hard to, uh, uh, it, that's a, it's a counterfactual, right? It's a theoretical argument that does, it's not possible to empirically test until, until, it's, until it's tested, but uh, I do think it, uh, it holds, up, uh, holds up well logically. So on your question about netting, so um, we spoke about the business contact rules, uh, which requires the swap dealers, if they're trading uncleared swaps uh, with clients, they have to do portfolio composition. So sort of figure out how to sort of net those swaps. And in the uncleared space, uh, even before it sort of predates dot Frank, the industry has been sort of having this multilateral competition exercises because most of the swaps are not fungible, they're not identical, just like in the corporate bond world. So it's difficult to net them. So there's uh, this whole sort of institutional service that is developed called portfolio competition, which achieves the same goals as uh, netting. And in the cleared space, uh, because it goes to the clearing houses, the clearing houses also offer netting. And to the extent that is, uh, the contracts are not fungible, the swaps are not fungible, they also offer portfolio competition. So if you look at actually some of the activity on the regulated platforms, a huge uh, portion of activity in the interest rate uh, swap space is from actually portfolio competition. And the credit space, the services are offered, but it still it tends to be a smaller portion of the market. So that's something which is sort of mandated, and even, as I said, even before we mandated it, the industry has been working on it. And Jim has a question. I'm glad that the issue of T plus two is brought up, and I was wondering if, uh, Cynthia, if you could provide some more color as to one, why Europe got its act together before us, what's holding us up, and when are we going to get around to T plus two, let alone T plus one? Um, I don't know what's holding us up. I did speak to someone who was at the SEC over lunch who just said it's just a matter of bandwidth at the regulators, you know, that they would want to do a study and, and understand. Um, so, uh, so DTCC took the issue up about two years ago in 2012. A study was done and it was discovered that most participants, most role players in the marketplace would prefer T plus one or worse T plus two settlement cycle. That would reduce the capital that the dealers have to put up to the DTCC. It would also um, reduce the counterparty exposure that we would have between trade date and settlement date. And for those of us who live in the world of operations, there's a long time tested phrase, nothing good happens between trade date and settlement date. The only thing that can happen is fail. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so the sooner you get delivery, the better off you are. Many people in the world, so there's, a, there's an investor awareness, many people in the world who buy videos in real time, mattresses in four hours, cars in 12 hours, uh, aren't aware that it takes three days to, de to deliver a stock. So there was a, a study put together. There are 12 um, steps that have to be done, such as eliminating the paper stocks. People like their shares of Disney. So the dematerialization of physical um, certificates has to occur. Um, trade matching. How do I know what I did with you is the same? We have to then match our stuff, zap it electronically before it's settled. Many people um, won't match on T plus zero, on, on trade date. They wait, they do it overnight, people do it offshore. So this, this uh, increases the propensity to fail. I don't know why Europe jumped ahead. Um, they've had this target to securities uh, harmonization effort going on for, I'd say, nearly a decade. Um, and the shorter settle cycle was a component of a larger um, marketplace harmonization effort. And it just happened to be that they um, passed their law a couple of years ago. The deadline is technically January 1st, 2015, but most of the countries decided to opt in the first weekend after quarter and which is going to be October 6th in three weeks. I think it's great for the U.S. that the Europeans are doing that. It's, they have 35 to 40 different places that, like vaults, if you will, where the securities settle. And uh, it's very complicated to figure out if the buyer and the seller are going to meet at the same vault to make delivery. That's a lot of upfront work that they have to worry. Well, we who operate over there have to worry about that we don't have to worry about here where we just have the DCCC. Uh, the big holdup in the U.S. right now, the big, I would say, loudest voice is, um, ironically, the wealth management firms that uh, have, have large swaths of retail investors. The... Um, the, the image of, you know, and I'm seeing the little old lady who delivers her check, she's then waiting for her stock, or she withdraws her stock, puts it in under her mattress because she's afraid of, she doesn't trust the bank. These sorts of um, images that were touted, you know, 50 or 60 years ago are, are brought to light as, uh, as reasons why a shorter settle cycle would harm the end investor the retail investor. Now, we are a large investor on behalf of retail investors. We would disagree with that philosophy. I think um, there have been some studies that have demonstrated that many of these large uh, wealth management firms are actually generating a profit on the securities revenue that occurs in the three days. I mean, where there's uh, money to be made, there's an incentive to stick with a, any given practice. And so I think if there were an incentive, a fiscal incentive, to shorten the settle cycle on some of these firms, they might change their mind. So where it stands right now is there's going to be another study um, on the building block, but many of us are out there saying, well, let's just do, without regulation, a merit in its own right, let's match our trades on trade date. Let's use digitized settlement instructions. The fact people type in ABA numbers for where the securities and monies are, it introduced propensity for human error and also an opportunity for fraud as well as fail. So. Just those two steps, matching trades and digitized settlement instructions, we could rally people around that. It would make it easier to meet the goal, but I think it will, it will ultimately take a regulator to, to, um, to just basically draw the line in the sand. I'm happy that Europe went for that. All of our um, clients who invest in the European market are going to benefit from that change, and I hope that one day um, the end investor in the U.S. will also benefit from such a change. Actually, it's interesting. Uh, spent some time in India and uh, working in India, grew up there, uh, and it's amazing. So they went uh, in a very short time. They de de uh, dematerialized all the stock. So I was always thinking, if a country like India, millions of people, uh, very archaic technologies, don't have access to the internet and so on and so forth, could dematerialize. Why is the U.S. still struggling? Uh, they are on T plus two, and they actually talk about uh, working with local exchanges. Uh, the market participants were ready to move to T plus one, but the banking system was uh, sort of lagging, I guess. Uh, and on the corporate bond space, uh, it's one of the things which implemented, thanks to the regulatory push, was same day settlement. So it's um, on T day, so we can sort of settle, and they use the infrastructure that the clearing houses had to sort of get the uh, settlement done. So, and then we were working on a stock lending and borrowing platform, and uh, of surveyed uh, 
post trade practices from around the world and sort of exchange notes with regulators in other emerging markets. And there was consensus that don't copy the US when it comes to post trade. It's totally <laughs> possible. I mean, if it's possible to short a stock and borrow it on a same day basis, sure. it's possible to do an over the counter yeah. delivery versus payment buy or sell. So it's completely possible the infrastructure exists. It's a matter of um, rallying around the clause. I, I think, and uh, and um, I guess that's all <laughs> I have to say. It's possible. Pimco's stance is that we would endorse a shorter settle cycle, resoundingly. It would it would restore confidence in our marketplace. Be one step towards that. So I want to do two things at this point. Uh, first of all, thank our panelists uh, for a wonderful discussion here. And uh, Dean David Thomas has joined us. Uh, David, if I might ask you to come up and just uh, offer a few comments. It's, uh, it's been a long, very productive, uh, uh, sometimes intense discussion. Uh, regulators, market participants, academia, everybody coming together to have a very productive day today. Great. Uh, so I'll be short. Uh, and uh, I, I just wanted to take the opportunity, and I, and I apologize for not being here earlier this morning, uh, but we were having a senior executive retreat called by uh, my boss, the president, and I figured it would probably do me good to be there, given it's uh, him calling it. Otherwise, I would have been here this morning. But I just wanted to take the time to thank you all uh, for coming here uh, to Georgetown's McDonough School of Business to have this important uh, convening. Uh, one of the things that uh, we talk about here is uh, excellence in research to impact practice. And uh, that means that in order to do that, we have to have the ability to not only produce uh, new knowledge about important problems and questions, but also the capacity to convene those actors, practitioners, regulators, as well as scholars who collectively uh, can come up with the guidance and solutions and experiments uh, that will move uh, our financial markets uh, uh, forward in a positive way. And if you, if you ask me, uh, there's not much more important than our ability to create high quality financial markets in which people have trust and confidence. Uh, it is really the oil that makes democratic capitalism work. And uh, we've all seen moments where that was in jeopardy uh, in terms of that trust and confidence. So there's not much work that I can think of today uh, that uh, is more important or has more implications uh, for the kind of world that we'd all like to create than the work that you were doing in the building this morning. So I just want to recognize that and thank you for allowing us to be the place where uh, you came to have this important conversation. Thank you. And I want to add my own thank you uh, to everyone, uh, our panelists, uh, everybody who participated and to all of you for uh, being here today. I want to thank our sponsors uh, once again. Uh, we can do these activities because of uh, our sponsors and our participants. Uh, my colleagues at the McDonough School have been absolutely terrific. But the one person who deserves really special mention is uh, the assistant director of the center, Dana uh, Stefanczak. Dana is at the back there. She made it all happen. Thank you. Dana worked with our marketing and communications team, and uh, they took care of everything. You can see how relaxed I am. I didn't have to do much. Uh, I just sat back and enjoyed and, uh, and uh, enjoyed the discussion. Please uh, join us for a reception now. And uh, again, thank you for coming. Thank you. Oh, so amazing. Oh, thank, you. Such a great oh, thank you so much.